Well, hey friends, thank you for joining me again. Today I want to talk to you about the top five things every Christian must do to prepare for war. Many prophets are saying that war is coming to the world. A lot of them are saying that it's coming as early as 2025. I haven't received anything from the Lord as far as the timing, but I do believe at some point we will see a, a large-scale war, a full-scale war in the nations again. And I say that because over the last 20 years, I've seen war in the U.S. and abroad in dreams and visions going back as far as 99 and 2000. And since then, I've had dreams, I've had visions in prayer where I've seen foreign troops on American soil, fighter jets flying over American cities, martial law, military checkpoint, shortages of food, shortages of medicines at pharmacies, pharmacies with bars on the windows and doors. And I also saw churches meeting in homes and pastors and leadership teams going from house to house to minister and to, to preach the word and to pray for the saints because just large gatherings were not allowed. So I don't share this to cause fear and panic. I'm sharing this because I pray before doing these videos. And I was asking the Lord, what do you want to talk about? And he said, prepare them for war. So I began to pray into it and go to the word and start to journal on this. And later that same afternoon, this was confirmed by a brother outside of our church that it's time to, to get ready and make ourselves ready and prepare for war. So I want to share with you three foundational principles that we need to understand to get a basis and a starting point to prepare. And then I will talk about five preparations that every Christian needs to make starting as soon as possible in order to be ready, effective, and victorious, okay? I'm Jeff. This is the Majesty of Mystery Tour. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Please help me get the word out. Okay, so three foundational principles. Principle number one, we are already at war. We don't need to wait for a declaration of war, some kind of big announcement. Just because you didn't get the email or the text notification doesn't mean that it hasn't started yet. Both in the natural and in the spirit realms, it's already underway, okay? And just because we don't hear from the news media that officially war has been declared doesn't mean it hasn't started. It's happening. We've been so desensitized to war by just constant drone strikes, skirmishes. We hear this all the time, and it sort of desensitizes us to it, and we just think that's normal now. These little skirmishes are just a spillover from what's happening behind the scenes all the time. There's cyber war. There's all kinds of things happening, and, and those little skirmishes, those little battles that we see, they might look like a one-off incident, but they're not. They're just a, a battle that we can identify in a large-scale war, okay? So it's very important that we understand that. And I say that because we have to accept that we are a wartime generation. We hear the phrase wartime generation and we think, you know, World War I, World War II, Vietnam. We think of entire nations mobilizing to go to war in the same way that we saw entire nations mobilized to go to war in the past. We have to mobilize as a holy nation, as the people of God. We have to make the necessary sacrifices and pay the price now. We see a physical battle going on between nations, but there is a spiritual battle going on right now for truth. And this is what I heard. There is a battle going on for the hearts, minds, bodies, and futures of our children. Okay, so we're already at war. It's happening. Number two, this war is fought in the natural and in the spiritual realm. Second Kings chapter six, this is down around verse 16 to 18. This is when Elisha and his servant were holed up in the city and the city was surrounded by the Syrians and Elisha's servant was freaking out going, oh my gosh, you know, there's so many of them. And this is what Elisha said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And we need to remember that. Remember, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you would open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We have to remember that we are spirits having a bodily experience. Okay. A lot of times people say I had a spiritual experience. Okay. As believers, we are spirits. Our spirit's been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. We are having a bodily experience. We have to understand the nature of the battle for us as the saints is spiritual. Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, 
against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We have to understand people are not the enemy. The evil forces that influence them are the enemy. We're going to see violence between nations, civil unrest, probably civil war. But as the saints, we're still not fighting against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of darkness. Okay, number three, understand whose side you're on. The Lord taught me this one years ago. It was so funny how he did it. Joshua chapter five, around verse 13. This is when Joshua went up to spy out Jericho and develop a strategy for attacking Jericho. And it says, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And listen to what the Lord says. <laughs> Verse 14, he says, no. <laughs> I love that answer. Just no. Some translations, he says, neither. I'm not for you or your enemy. In other words, I'm not on your side. It's you that are on my side. So he says, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua has the appropriate response. He fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? We have to take that same posture. It's not us versus them. This is the Lord's battle. This is his thing. He has a strategy. He is the Lord of angel armies. We have to understand we're not asking God to be on our side. It's us that are on his side. I think the cultural influence of humanism has really given us a twisted perspective on the self. And so we idolize the Lone Ranger and the Maverick. Brothers and sisters, that's from Hollywood. That's not from the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not looking for us to form some kind of like private militia that's going to wage an insurgency campaign against the enemy, okay? He has already established divine order. He's in charge. He has a strategy. We don't have to figure it out. <laughs> It's we who are on his side. We just need to get on board with that. So those are the three principles. We're already at war. It's fought in the natural and the spiritual realm. And we have to understand that we are on the Lord's side. All right, so now let's get into five things every Christian must do to repair. I'm going to try to go through these really quickly. Number one, you have to develop a wartime mentality. The first battle that we will ever fight is in our mind. I want to say that one more time. The first battle that we will ever fight is in our mind. The Lord told me this about my own life. He said, if you can win the battle in your heart and your mind over what you're going to believe, even about your circumstances, he said, all the other battles will take care of themselves. So this battle is over how we're going to respond to our circumstances, no matter what comes our way in the natural, no matter what we're faced with. You know, power grids could go down. We could end up not being able to, to get to our house because of a military checkpoint or something. Or it could be something where you can only go shopping on one day of the week. No matter what happens, the battle we fight is not in complaining and grumbling against our politicians and all these things. The battle we fight is in our mind. It's over what we're going to believe and how we're going to respond. Are we going to respond in faith or in fear? Are we going to start taking control and start to hoard and do all these things? Or are we going to trust the Lord? Are we going to panic or are we going to get a hold of God, find out what his word says, and then stand on his word? First Peter 1.13 says this, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. First Peter 4.7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. In other words, even if we're praying feverishly, if, if we're not sober-minded, if we're not thinking right and we have no self-control, we're, we're going to pray amiss. We're not going to pray according to the will of God, okay? 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful. So three times he said be sober-minded, and this is a common theme in the Word about being sober-minded. So what does it mean? It means to be alert, watchful, not distracted by the comforts and the entertainment of this world. We have different goals than them. We're not living for retirement. We're not living for a 401k or investments or anything. We are here to serve the Lord. We are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the delicacies of Babylon will make us weak, fat, and forget who we are. This is not the time for excess. This is the time for discipline, okay? So we have to develop a wartime mentality. And we also have to develop the will to fight. We can't take these things lying down. I was talking to my friend Willie Jordan just the other day, and he was telling me about 
in his church, one of the things that he's preaching out in Kansas, the Lord told him to tell his people, you have to fight for your marriage. You have to fight for your children, fight for your church, fight for your nation, fight for your health, your finances, fight for your calling and for your anointing. Don't just let these circumstances come to you and say, oh, well, I guess this is it. No, man, we got to fight for this in prayer, in the word. I'm going through this health challenge right now. I'm recovering from pericarditis and it's slow, but the Lord's in it. I see the Lord's hand in it and the Lord is teaching me to fight. He's teaching me to get his heart and his mind about this thing and then go to his word and use his word and declare his word. And when the thoughts come and even when the sickness comes, we have this saying in the church where we say, I am saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. Talks about the completed work of the cross sanctification that we're going through in our life, and then the final salvation when either the Lord returns or we're taken to glory. Well, the Lord's been telling me this. You start declaring, I am healed. I am being healed. I will be healed. (laughs) How about that? We have to fight. We have to develop a mentality that is of a soldier fighting for the outcome because the Lord has already established it. 2 Timothy 2.4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. And I feel like that's a word for the church, man. We have been so entangled in civilian pursuits. That would be the pursuits of people, like Jesus said in Matthew 6, running around seeking after what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? They drive themselves crazy running around trying to meet their own needs. Your heavenly father already knows what you need before you ask him. So seek first the kingdom. Okay, so number two, understand the enemy's tactics. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 says, If we are ignorant of the evil one's schemes against us, he'll take advantage of us. If we don't know what we're going to be facing from him, if we don't know what the attacks are going to look like, then we'll get caught off guard, okay? Now, I want to be really, really clear here. You do not have to understand the Illuminati. You do not have to understand witchcraft. What Jesus called in Revelation, I think it's in chapter 2, I think it was to the church of Thyatira. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I think it was Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Thyatira. I don't have it in my notes. But Jesus said, I basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I appreciate that you don't know the so-called deep things of Satan. It's a waste of time. It's better for us to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know his word, to be known in heaven. It is more advantageous for us. What I'm talking about is just understanding the nature of the attacks against us, what his weapons are, so that when they come against us, we're not caught off guard. What I am talking about, the attacks and things that we need to understand, lies, accusations, fear, temptation, we need to learn to identify those things when they pop up, when they come against us, okay? Anything that tries to manipulate, intimidate, or dominate is witchcraft. There is an evil spirit behind that. I'm going to say that one more time. Anything that attempts to manipulate, intimidate, or dominate is witchcraft. That is the hallmark of witchcraft. And I'm going to say something, brothers and sisters, because we're the saints of God. Christians do it too. Christians do it too. I've seen it my whole life. And I've had to repent myself. Where you have a desired outcome, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So you try to manipulate the situation or intimidate someone into doing what you want or dominate the situation by not letting other people talk or speak or have their way or have input. I'm telling you, we call it charismatic witchcraft. And if you're going to operate in that, then you're going to open yourself up to that. Jesus said the same measure that you use will be used to measure back to you. Okay, so I'm just telling you, man, learn to recognize it and don't engage in it. All right. Don't operate in that. Okay. the Lord will lead us like a shepherd. I'm talking about when the evil one attacks us with lies or fear or condemnation, accusation, guilt, shame. That's all from the evil one. Okay. remember this. The Lord will lead us like a shepherd. The evil one will try to drive us in panic and fear and guilt and accusation. So learn to recognize those attacks when they come so you're not caught off guard. Number three, know your weapons and your body armor. No nation or ruler, no government will send their soldiers into battle without the proper equipment and training. They wouldn't do that. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't done that either. He has given us powerful and effective weapons. We have to know what they are. We have to acquaint ourselves with them. We have to know what they are, train with them, and use them. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or not natural, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, 
casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Remember what I told you in the beginning, the first battle, the most important battle is in our mind. These weapons, they're prayer. The prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much or is very effective. The word, look at the Lord. The Lord Jesus defeated the evil one with the word. He quoted scripture to him. The blood, Revelation says they overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Worship, think about how the evil spirit left Saul as David worshiped. And rest, rest is a weapon. The battle is the Lord's. <laughs> Stand and see the salvation of your God, right? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Those five things, prayer, the word, the blood, worship, and rest, those are like the five smooth stones that David went from the brook Cherith and he put in his shepherd's pouch so that he could have stones to sling against Goliath and his brothers if they tried to attack him. So these things, this is what I received in prayer over this video. Those five things are like five smooth stones. That means they're giant killers, okay? Your prayers, the word, the blood, worship, and rest. Those are giant killers. All right, now let's move on to Ephesians. I want to try to get through this really quickly. I know I got a lot in me. I'm trying to talk quickly and get this out. Thanks for staying with me. This is point, still point number three. And the other two, four and five, I'll get through quickly. But Ephesians chapter six, starting in verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Wow, this is so great. So there's a lot of weapons here. There's a lot of armor here, but we actually have to engage them in the Spirit. Now, this is what I mean. I've seen this my whole life. Please bear with me. I hope I don't offend anybody. You can't just say, I put on the belt of truth and make a motion like you're putting on a belt. Like, like that's good to help you remember, but that's for Sunday school kids to learn Ephesians chapter six and memorize the armor. It's not enough to go through a hand motion with an invisible belt around your waist and say, I put on the belt of truth. Here's what we have to do. We actually have to act in truth. We have to love the truth, embrace the truth, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it confronts us. We have to be truthful in our thoughts, in our speech, in our actions. We have to be honest, okay? We have to operate in truth. Do you see the difference? It's, it's not just like a Sunday school motion, and I decree and declare I have the belt of truth on. Great. Are you embracing the truth? Are you open to the truth? Is the truth actually able to penetrate your heart and mind? Are you speaking the truth? With all of these, we have to engage them with our spirit and we have to walk them out. That's how these weapons are effective. Okay, real quick, belt of truth counteracts lies and deception. The belt of truth also holds all the rest of the armor together and keeps the sword on. So if we lose the battle for truth in our heart and mind, it's over, okay? It, that's what connects everything. It's the first one mentioned. It's what keeps everything together and holds the sword of the Spirit on just the Word of God. So fight for the truth over what you believe to not be deceived. Breastplate of righteousness. It's right here, right? The righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. This protects our heart and our beliefs about ourselves. This counteracts guilt, shame, and condemnation. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when the evil one comes at you with shame and with guilt and with condemnation, you're like, I know, <laughs> I know, but it's Jesus who gave me his righteousness. And I stand in front of you, not in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Feet shod with the gospel, the preparation of peace. The feet speak of authority. I think of the Lord speaking to Joshua in chapter one, where he said, every place where the sole of your foot touches will be an inheritance for you. They also speak of our mission, our calling and our authority. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It helps us to stay grounded when we think about having our feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace. It helps us to stay grounded and focused on who we are fighting for, whose mission this is, whose vision and goals we are fighting for. It's not ours, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting that he says the gospel of the preparation of peace because Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 says, of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. 
So as we go as sons and daughters of the king, and we declare the kingdom has come and the government of the Lord, it brings the increase of peace. That's why it's the gospel of peace. Okay, shield of faith. The shield of faith counteracts lies, doubt, and unbelief. It extinguishes the fiery darts, fiery thoughts in our heads. That's what it does. That shield of faith is like, I'm not going to believe that. That's not getting into my heart. That's not getting into my mind. I'm not giving that access to me because we do the work of believing. My righteous one will live by faith, right? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Helmet of salvation, again, it protects our thinking, our mind. Do you see how important our thoughts are and the battle is in our mind? He keeps going over and over these things. Our vision, our belief systems, no matter what the enemy tries to throw at me, I am saved. The Lord Jesus has me. I belong to him. I'm his. I'm not my own. He will perfect that which concerns me. He will bring to pass that which is appointed for me, right? All my times are in his hands. You complete the work that he began in me. I'm saved. I'm his problem, right? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the only offensive weapon, the only attack weapon. Think about this for a minute. We do damage to the enemy when we speak the word. This is actually damaging the enemy. This is what Jesus did with the evil one in the wilderness. So speak the word to the lies and the accusations, the fear and the temptation. Pray in the spirit. Pray in tongues if you do. If you don't, ask the Lord if you can. If not, just continue to pray. Pray with your understanding and pray in the spirit. A lot of people forget this is in the armor. They just go through, in Ephesians 6, they just go through the different things. The helmet and the breastplate and the belt and the sword and the feet shod and the, the shield of faith. But they forget. It goes on and says, and pray always in the spirit. And be watchful. That's another one. Don't forget to be watchful. Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray. The word used here implies a night watchman, someone who's keeping awake, who's alert, who's on the lookout. All right, so that's number three. Know your weapons, know your body armor. Number four, know your people. Soldiers do not fight alone. If you fight alone, you'll get picked off. In fact, the word says one can put a thousand to flight and two, 10,000. That's in Joshua chapter 23. Our warfare increases exponentially when we fight with other people. You're going to do more with somebody when, that you're in unity and agreement with than you will by yourself alone. Get over a fence, bear one another's burdens, confess our sins to one another, pray for one another. This battle is not going to be won by lone rangers. It is going to be won by the corporate bride of Christ, the saints. Here's another thing on this point of knowing your people. Man, I just got to say it. You got to get back to church. Don't forsake assembling together. Get over style differences. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner or habit of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day, meaning the day of the Lord, approaching. This means go to church to encourage people, not just to be encouraged by people. You got to live in community and develop those relationships where you're, you're being taken care of and taking care of other people. There are hard times coming to the world. And don't wait until it's too late to start trying to make friends. You need them now, okay? Think kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. If you're a pastor, start ordaining elders if you haven't already. You're not in competition with the church down the street, okay? A win for them is a win for you. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, if one suffers, we all suffer. If one rejoices, we all rejoice. So know your people and get to church. Figure out where you can serve and encourage. Number five, and this is the last one. I hope you're still with me. Number five, know your post. Okay, it was know your people. Now it's know your post. Where has God placed you? Not three to five years in the future that you're hoping to be here or there with your three-year, five-year plan. Those things are great, but they can steal us from the present if we're not careful. Where are you now? Where has the Lord planted you now and take dominion there? Serve right there. So know your post. Think about this. When a soldier abandons their post, they put others in danger. They create a breach in the defenses. What if you're hoping for a promotion and a place in the ministry or you're hoping for a blessing or a new opportunity to open up and the Lord is actually hoping just for you to be faithful right where you're at? I'm not saying those things don't happen and they won't come in the future, but now while it's today, where does the Lord want to assign us and put us? You know, Nehemiah, when the wall was being rebuilt, he assigned people sections of the wall to build. And these people had other careers. Not everybody in Israel was a wall builder. 
It says there were gold workers, there were perfumers, but they all worked building that wall. And each one had to build the part that they were assigned to, because if they didn't finish, they would be responsible for a breach. I think I've made my point. But what I see as a pastor is there are breaches in the walls of the body of Christ. There are breaches in the city of New Jerusalem because a lot of people have forsaken and abandoned their post because they're too busy looking over here or looking over there. Uh, you know, I don't like the style and I don't like the worship. And man, it's time to get over that. We're on a wartime footing. We need to stick to our post and complete the wall. Okay. I think that's it, man. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Those are the five things every believer must do to prepare for war. Number one, develop a wartime mentality. Be sober-minded and alert. Be watchful. Number two, understand the enemy's tactics. Know what he's going to try to throw at, at you. Lies, deception, doubt, unbelief, fear, accusations. Just know that that's coming. So when it shows up in your mind and your heart, you're ready for it, okay? Number three, know your weapons and know your body armor. Our weapons are mighty in God. Number four, know your people. There's strength in numbers, right? And number five, know your post. Never leave your post because you'll put other people in danger. Just remember that we're already at war. It's here. It's not coming. It's here. We fight in the spirit realm with spiritual weapons that are given to us by God. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself is leading us by his word and his spirit. He has already determined the end. We cannot fail, even if he costs us our lives. If you can think of any other preps, and I'm talking spiritual preps, not like store food. Maybe I'll do a video on that. I'm not really that guy. There's plenty of videos already out there on that. But if you can think of spiritual preps, things that we can do to prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready for the day of battle in the spirit, in intercession, please post those in the comments below. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm Jeff. This is the Majesty and Mystery Tour. Thank you so much for watching. I ask that you would please like, subscribe, and share. Thanks, friends.